I welcome you all at this conference, Sustainability, the Water, Energy, Food, Nexus. I'm Amit Padri, I'm the executive director of Global Water System Project. It has been amazing. Uh, after successfully organizing the Water in the Anthropocene Conference last year at the same place, nearly the same time in May, we are back again to discuss another very relevant uh, policy topic. And this time, with several key partners, we are, with thanks to United Nations Environmental Program, we are thankful to Jammu Development Institute, Center for Development Research, Water, Land, and Ecosystem Program of the CDIR, and with the kind support of German Federal Minister of Education and Research, along with Ministry of Empowerment and Development, yeah, to organize this conference and their timely and valuable support. Yes, it's true. We are having another Nexus conference, and to be true, we are considering this conference is considering all the key outcomes of the past Nexus events high-level policy discussions on Nexus, and it is a one step forward. We need integrated thinking on Nexus, and this conference will be one just platform to follow up. We all understand that we need Nexus. It's not a new thing, we need Nexus, but we need to know how to implement Nexus. We need evidence-based action. We need more knowledge and how to implement. And this conference aims to bring science in this Nexus debate to help at the current policy making uh, in Nexus. Today we are very close in formulating sustainable development goals, this conference also aims uh, to reflect and explore the role of Nexus in SDGs development and implementation and bring uh, a broader perspective of sustainability, address sustainability, and particularly address governance and tools at different scales. Saying that, uh, I want to invite our keynote speakers to their mornings in the plenary. Uh, our first speaker was Dr. Wilfred Krauss, Deputy Director General, Sustainability, Climate and Energy Division. Uh, at a short notice, he's unable to come. And uh, I will ask Dr. Thomas Depey to come and present. In the past, BMBF have supported several application-oriented projects involving science, practitioners, industries on water, energy, and other resources. And BMBF has also supported uh, GWSP to coordinate global water research and to have such kind of conferences. Uh, please welcome Dr. Thomas Depe from the Project Management Culture Institute of Technology to present on behalf of the President Krauss. Management Agency, Karlsruhe. 
amongst other tasks, we work on behalf of BNDF and do the management of projects and programs in the field of water research. This conference is organized by the Global Water System Project, which BNDF has been funding for nearly one decade now. During this time, the aim of the project has been to investigate how humans are changing the global water cycle and which are the social feedbacks to these changes. <laughs> In an interconnected world, however, it becomes more and more important <coughs> to identify and examine linkages across sectors. For instance, how water is linked to other key natural resources. Meanwhile, it's widely accepted that the nexus between water, energy, <coughs> plays a key role when we have developed strategies for sustainable development in the management of natural resources. Let us start with recalling a fact which summarizes the basic situation in a nutshell. Although 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, not even 1% of the water resources is ground in surface water, which is available for humans and ecosystems. Future challenges in water research will result mainly from the widening gap between an increasing demand and increasing availability of water. The growing population density will exert enormous pressure on Earth's limited water resources. Roughly two-thirds of people will live in urban areas, so there are structural problems connected to population growth. Now, 90% of the population growth will take place in developing and threshold countries, so that more than three-quarters of the additional food needed will be produced on irrigated land. Moreover, increasing amounts of water will be needed for industrial production and for power generation in the developing and developed countries. Water needs for energy production are predicted to grow uh, at twice the rate of energy demand. On the other hand, various factors lead to a decrease in water availability. The effects of climate change add up to problems caused by the poor water management, like pollution problems, water losses, and pollution. As a part of integrated water management, research, development, and innovation will provide solutions for problems evolving from the outline situation. On the following slide, I want to give you three examples of EMDF funding illustrating this point of view and the importance of the water energy food nexus. After a short chronicle of EMDF funding of the Global Water System Project, I want to give you an illustration of uh, international operations run by EMDF. And uh, thirdly, I want to give you an example from the funding priority sustainable water management in German Nachhaltiges Wasser Management or NADA. And I want to show you one of the recent funding measures. The Global Water Systems Project is one element in BMBF's approach to support research on global water challenges. It was established between 2002 and 2004 as a joint project of the four global environmental change programs run back then. Since 2003, the MBF has supported the International Project Office of the GWSB with a budget of more than 3 million euros. Up to now, the GWSB has substantially contributed to develop sustainable approaches in solving the global water problems for example, by its involvement in the global program. And as you can see from the gray shaded box here, activities connected to the water and energy food nexus have become more and more important, also for GWSP. 
ending up in today's conference on sustainability in the water energy code next. Let's change now to the international scene. I promise you an example from international cooperation. The example belongs to the manifold international corporations run by EMDF. It's part of the program Clean Water, which today forms the center of the German-Chinese cooperation. In this program, work packages have been defined in four sectors. You can see on the slide, water supply, wastewater treatment, water resources protection, and clean industrial production. <coughs> Given a rapidly growing economy in China, which has caused severe environmental pollution and health damages to the local people, the Chinese are very interested to learn to profit from Germany's experience. Germany has undergone a similar development in the 1960s and 70s, and subsequently has established a successfully an environmentally friendly management of its own resources. The first large-scale project that was agreed under the Clean Water Program is called Semi Central. This is a modular concept for rapidly growing urban areas and uh, is an outstanding example for the importance of the nexus between water, energy, and agricultural production in innovative water management approaches. It has been developed since 2003 in the cooperative German-Chinese effort and was launched some three weeks ago by State Secretary Georg Schütte in Qingdao on the occasion of the World Horticultural Exposition. Semizentral, the Semizentral facility is uh, able to adapt to rapid urban growth and uh, it's a modular concept, as I mentioned before, uh, to uh, ten, um, design for 10,000 to 100,000 inhabitants. <clears throat> Up to 40% of fresh water can be saved by the reuse of grey water, for example, from showers or washing machines. That's one effect. Uh, secondly, by the addition of bio-waste and the production of bio gas, this plant is able to produce its own, its own energy and thus can be run at least energy neutrally, maybe even energy positively. Moreover, it is planned to use the sludge for agricultural production. So we have all aspects here of the water energy food next. Further support research for sustainable water management, and now I come to my third example. EMDF has bundled its activities in a funding priority called Sustainable Water Management in German, Nachhaltiges Wasser Management in AVA. NAVAM comprises five different research fields, and one of them concentrates on the nexus between energy and water. NAVAM was started in 2010 with an indicative budget of some 200, about 200 million euros. Here you see the five thematic areas. In this concentration, in this presentation, I want to concentrate on the subject area called water and energy. A <clears throat> call on future-oriented technologies and <coughs> concepts for an energy efficient and resource saving water management was launched in March 2012 and then subsequently there was a two-stage evaluation and the further processing of the selected proposals. Currently 12 joint projects are starting the work. I will tell you some details later. And these projects focus on the nexus between water, energy and resources. Still, water supply and wastewater treatment facilities are the largest municipal energy consumers. Their electricity requirements per year equal the needs of 1.6 million four-person households or a city of 6 
6.4 million inhabitants per year. Wastewater treatment alone accounts for 20% of the municipal electricity consumption. This is why in recent years, energy efficiency has gained more and more importance in water management. An increase in efficiency can be realized on one hand by minimization or optimization of energy needs. On the other hand, inherent potentials for energy rate and generation can be used, for example, from wastewater. In many cases, there are synergies between energy optimization and the management of metal flows. For example, energetic sewage sludge recovery can recover the phosphorus recycling. Last but not least, a reduced utilization of primary energy sources reduces carbon dioxide emissions, so it can be understood as a contribution to the National Climate Protection Strategy. With a turnaround in energy, energy policy, called Energiewende, Germany strives for a decentralized energy supply from renewable resources. It is planned that in 2050, 80% of the electricity consumption will originate from renewables. By following the outline goals, water management can give an important contribution to the energy vendor by saving energy, higher energy efficiency, by its own energy generation and utilization of the given potentials, and by integration of water management facilities into a regional network of energy and metal flow. With the funding measure Airbus, the NBF intends to support application-oriented projects with partners from practice, industry and science. The projects will focus on two thematic areas, public water supply and public wastewater management. In both subject areas, innovative technologies and processes will be developed to obtain a higher energy efficiency. Potentials for energy generation will be explored. For example, in wastewater management, the vision is to establish energy independent plants in the future, which may even produce an energy surplus. If you want to optimize energy requirements, improved concepts for control and operational management are an important component. For example, this mainly applies to the projects dealing with water supply networks. Finally, it is important that in Airbus water management facilities are not considered as isolated units, as I mentioned before. On the contrary, they are investigated as integral parts of a regional network of energy and material flow. The funding measure AVAS will comprise 12 collaborative projects with a duration of three years. The project has just started in April and May. And there will be one networking and transfer project supporting the MDF and the project management agency in the transfer of results and in the networking which is necessary to have a successful funding measure. All in all, there are 67 partners involved and they work on 20 research sites. Research sites means water distribution networks. Uh, water, wastewater treatment plants, and in some cases, laboratories. <coughs> the total funding volume will amount to 27 million euros. The NABAM website is under construction, you can see it here on the slide, and will soon provide more comprehensive information on the projects, on the complementary measures, and on the events. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. I hope I could give you an insight of how the MDF tries to tackle the challenges 
connected to the water energy nexus. This conference provides a good platform to discuss further developments at the right time. In this sense, I wish you fruitful discussions and good progress in the nexus approach for the coming two days. Thank you very much.
and so on. And what it shows in between, and I think this is very important, is uh, the allocation decisions which are taken within resources for securing their productive use and the regeneration. And this shows that the linkages between resources are complex in themselves because they may interfere in the internal allocation processes and uh, dynamics and logics uh, within uh, resources. And I think that this complexity is actually um, a mirrored uh, by the way um, policies and economic institutions are designed to deal with these linkages among resource management areas but also within resources. So that is um, the challenge which I think is, is applying to, um, to governing the next system conceiving what government actually has to, has to achieve. So what we know is that policy and institutional linkages often are not aligned with the physical linkages in the sense that they do not protect physical interdependencies but expose them to exploitation and degradation. And similar effects are the result of ill-conceived subsidies, for example, and economic policies. So why is that so? There are many answers to this. Many of you are dealing with these topics in your respective panels, obviously. But I think we can agree that there are different normative concepts and policy goals which need um, sectoral coordination, but also intra-sectoral coordination. And these normative, different normative concepts are play out in different ways. When we look at water, there's no surprise and no coincidence. I think that this nexus thinking has been put forward by, by the water community mostly. You have the, I say you because I, I don't design, uh, define myself as belonging really to the core of the water community. Colleagues at my institute um, know that very well. They are the experts. You can listen to them later to do much better. So you have the integrated water resource, resource management concept. And this is an integrated concept which is lacking, I believe, in other um, policy areas. There is no similar concept for energy guiding energy policy. There is no similar concept, from my point of view, as a dominant concept guiding agricultural policies or the management of the food chain. So, from my perception, energy and uh, food or agriculture are basically driven by the, the goal of enhancing securing supply. It's a, in a polemic way, you could say it's a productivist orientation still. And energy has been very much complemented by the uh, additional uh, goal to reduce emissions. And I say additional because reduce, uh, securing supply and reducing emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, are in many energy policies not, still not uh, fundamentally integrated or additional or parallel goals. And in food and agriculture um, policy, in many countries we still have subsidies in the water and energy uh, areas which are designed to support production, but obviously have negative effects on water and energy management too. There are some cross-compliance efforts. Uh, it's still to be seen whether the implementation, for example, of the carbon reform in the EU will really lead to additional gains in the environmental sector whether it will be undermined by implementation rules which in the end cost of production and at the expense of environmental um, objectives. But in Brazil, for example, there are also policy incentives like an environmental registry for um, uh, farms which are designed to support uh, in an integrated way economic and environmental goals like supporting measures against deforestation or against slave labor. The social dimension, I think, is something which is also often not very much underlined by um, policy linkages. So what we need is to move towards integrated design of policy institutions. This is what you can take from the movie, uh, from other, from many of the panels as they are conceived here. But what we see in reality is that joint goals and targets, more cross-compliance instruments are very difficult to get. So why is that so? And what I want to focus on here with my last slide is 
Why policy coordination when uh, it's so difficult? Yeah, this is a graph which I took from, um, from a, a policy paper by, by Fritz Schaaf and Renate Mainz. They, for a long time, were the directors of the very renowned Max Planck Institute in Cologne for the research on, on societies. And they worked all their life on, on policy coordination uh, for complex problems. So problems like the web nexus, problems which cross cut across areas and which require a new quality of policy coordination where you cannot rely on established uh, um, uh, procedures and established thinking within your sector. Uh, and, that, and, uh, how, and they define this type of complex problems which need new avenues of solution as characterized by the necessity to create new pro uh, problem solutions. That's what it's called here, salience of value creation. The value which needs to be created is the new problem solution. And at the same time, these problems are linked with distributional uh, uh, conflicts. Because when you devise a new problem solution, it is likely to have impacts on um, what is distributed. So either on access to funding, like when BMBF, when the Ministry of Research redefines the problems it wants to solve, then it has consequences for the institutes which normally access these funds of research, or it required it creates new requirements. Um, but it also has effects besides economic, on economic assets, also in terms of competencies. What the competency of your department, for example, may be. So it has uh, an, a distributional effect on power, on political power as well, on areas of responsibility. Complex problems require new ways of coordination, which in the end can be interpreted as taking away autonomy from myself. And I think that this um, tension between autonomy and coordination is something which all of you who work on governing the nexus may know very well. So they identified four types of um, policy coordination or modes of policy coordination. The most uh, uh, frequent one is what they call negative coordination. Negative coordination is something where departments or actors coordinate with each other by taking care of the interests and the competencies which are defined in law and procedures. So I don't touch your area of competence, I go do what I want so you don't interfere with me. I think those of you who are worked in ministries know very well what I'm talking about. But what you see is that this very frequent way of coordinating is very, doing very badly on creating additional value, on finding new solutions, and it's also obviously not doing very well on solving distributional problems associated with new problems. I mean, these problems are there, but they are defined away. And um, what I want to make clear here at this point also is that what we see in many departments or ministries is that they develop uh, a new diversity and a new integrated way of looking at problems inside themselves. This can be seen very clearly by the new programs of research defined, for example, in Germany by the Ministry of, of um, Research, or if you look at Horizon 2020, the EU framework program uh, starting now, which, which has made it a, a, a characteristic, a central characteristic of looking at problems in an integrated disciplinary way, for example. But this, from my view, has sort of substituted coordination between ministries. Because the, minister, the instrument you have at hand as, as one ministry only goes so far. And in fact, what I'm missing is that the experiences which are made with more diverse and integrated thinking within a ministry also nurture positive coordination between ministries. And this is the opposite, the exact opposite of, um, of negative coordination, it's called positive coordination. And here the point is that ministries have to engage, the type would be to engage at the same time in value creation, so in devising new problem solutions, 
and at the same time dealing with the distributional problems or consequences associated with them. This is a very ambitious way of policy coordination and it's not very frequent, obviously, because what happens? Ministries focus, prefer, in this complex situation, prefer to focus on the distributional consequences and push them aside, which blocks the opportunity, the opportunity to engage in problem solving. I think um, uh, the climate negotiations, as we, are, as we are seeing them at the moment, are very well represented by, by that. What's at stake is to achieve advances in positive coordination, but it's blocked by a strong attention to uh, distributional conflicts because there are no pre-established rules or agreements even on principles how to deal with these distributional uh, difficulties. So this uh, also explains to us why positive coordination is easier within a ministry because there the, leading, the leadership of the ministry can clarify the rules and, simply, and resolve the distributional issues within a ministry. But who would have the authority to deal with distributional conflicts between ministries. Um, what, we can, what we also have are two other modes. I want to highlight the bargaining, which is a very helpful mode for where you deal with distributional conflicts for implementing defined problem solutions. And there, the most um, uh, interesting instrument at hand, obviously, is compensation payments. But compensation payments are possible only when the environment or the, the, um, the environment of, of people reclaim, claiming for those compensations is clear and accountable. So it's very difficult, as we all know, to, uh, to use this coordination mode to um, compensate those who would uh, lose out in the distribution um, conflict um, at international levels. But it is possible at um, bilateral or trans-regional levels, as we know, for example, from negotiations about the benefits of uh, dams and hydropower. Finally, the, there is another mode of problem solving, which focuses on problem solving purely and leaves aside distribution issues. This is a mode which also is very attractive, obviously, for uh, uh, nurturing our thinking on how we could make advances at the, for solving uh, problems at the web nexus, but it requires um, to, to some strong decisions in the beginning on how to, to what is necessary for being able to leave distributional issues aside. So in any case, it would require negotiations about uh, that too. But the interesting thing, what Sharp and Mainz did then, was that they ran a computer program for modeling uh, sequences of negotiations where these different modes are combined. Because in reality, as you know, it's not that um, <coughs> actors say, OK, we do only problem solving or only bargaining. The interesting thing is that in reality, there may be sequences which combine these different modes of policy coordination in different ways. And what they found out is that, um, and I think that is the strategically helpful uh, insight, because what we are wondering, obviously, is how should we devise policy strategies for making advances in governance, in defining new normative con uh, concepts, and, uh, shared goals, as it was called, but also shared uh, policy instruments or policy instruments which do not act or have uh, impacts which go against each other and produce a negative or, a, or no change in the outcome. So what they found out in their simulation was that the most um, effective sequence in terms of maximizing welfare was to engage with a small coalition in positive coordination, then and then afterwards engage with um, all actors involved in the, in the uh, negotiation, first in negative coordination and in bargaining. So finally testing out the veto powers of the others and then compensating those which would lose out in the, in the solution uh, which found most agreement within the smaller uh, uh, negotiating coalition and uh, the larger one. So what 
this means is that we probably need actors which are courageous enough and imaginative enough to take such an initiative for establishing a leading coordination, a leading coalition which is um, equipped with the political mandate but also with the knowledge uh, for overcoming cognitive disagreements on defining the problem and defining, so defining the cause of effects which want to be tackled, need to be tackled, and for engaging in creative thinking on what adequate solutions would be and what adequate positive, uh, political instruments would be in the different sectors or departments, uh, the different actors of society which you need to engage in problem solving. And then to extend the solution proposals elaborated in this coalition and engaged in broader negotiation processes with other actors involved and also be ready to engage in compensation payments. This sounds very dry, but I think that there are many uh, examples which we will hear in the next, uh, today and tomorrow which illustrate um, this uh, thinking, um, but which may also help us to devise future research um, um, projects uh, from the perspective of these um, negotiating or policy coordination modes and in order to better understand what blocks us from going the next step. Germany is often quoted as a as, as a pioneer or as a good example to follow and I think we can find a lot of examples, as I said, I repeat this, within the areas of activity of specific ministries. But what I think we need more of is coordinated, courageous, innovative action between ministries. In the last coalition treaty, the, the term um, cross-departmental co policies was, I counted them, computers help us to do word counting more easily today, it was there 15 times, and in the previous coalition treaties, um, it was much less. So, at least in the policy declaration which is there, we can see some uh, spreading of this thinking. But the interesting thing, obviously, is to see it in practice, and to, under and to better understand what factors really facilitate more joint action and which factors keep blocking joint action uh, too much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Michels. Our next speaker was Dr. Akim Steiner, S Group Director of United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, that's a bad news. He's not here with us. <laughs> uh, but we have Dr. Thomas Chiramba, head of the Freshwater Unit of Environmental Policy and Planning Unit of UNEP. And uh, Dr. Chiramba will read Dr. Steiner's statement. I invite uh, Dr. Chiramba to come forward. Thank you very much, much Anik. Good morning, colleagues. Um, it's not an easy task. It's unfortunate uh, that Mr. Steiner could not join us. He regrets that very much because this topic is very close to his heart. And he thinks that the discussion around this topic are being done at the right time. As pointed out earlier, discussions around the SDGs are taking place right now. And this is the time perhaps new thinking is, is needed to shape the future development agenda of, of, the, of the world. Now, um, I would like first of all to welcome you uh, before I get going to his speech, because I am very pleased that GWSP and our partners that we are were partnering with agreed to organize um, this event around this topic. And um, uh, it was not easy, but uh, I think um, the, your presence here uh, shows that we are on the right track and we look forward to your comments, uh, to, to your input to this topic. Um, <laughs> um, 
Now, his, um, in his open welcome remarks, he just wanted to point out some of the issues that were out of concern to him that I thought perhaps the scientific community would look at. His major concern was around including the sustainability dimension in the nexus. He thought that just discussing water, food, and nexus, we could make a lot of progress on it, but without looking at the sustainability dimension, um, we would not go very far. And of course, being the head of the UN agency on the environment, I think that that's falls very well in, 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 in his mandate. The other thing that he was very concerned about is the whole issue about talking about this nexus without making reference to the bottom poor. And uh, in this case, uh, he is very concerned about libraries, about the discussions around this nexus, but linking it very strongly to, to, the, to, to, to how we can get, like what the quality is, the words that we've been going this time around are uh, not leaving everyone behind in our development process. Now, let me go through it, and then I will make a few more remarks uh, at the end. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the speech. When talking about environment and well-being, UNEP thinks in terms of ec ecosystems and what ecosystems do for people has been expressed ec as ecosystem services. These are the various services that people get from the ecosystems they live in, be it nature or other ecosystems or urban ecosystems. People who are poor in resources depend most heavily on ecosystems and their services for their basic needs of water, food, and energy. Water supply, food production, and energy are also called provisioning ecosystem services. These depend on healthy, well-functioning ecosystems. For instance, water supply depends on upstream catchments captured in rainwater filtering through the healthy soils so that downstream people can benefit from the reliable water supply of clean water. Similarly, hydropower generation depends on upstream regulation of air corrosion and flows of vegetated yield sites, be it with forest or crops. Ecosystems also provide energy. One could even um, argue that fossil fuels present services from prehistoric times. But aside from fossil and nuclear fuels, ecosystems provide renewable energy such as hydropower and bioenergy. Bioenergy comprises some 10% of global energy use. Poor people, in particular, use animals instead of fossil fuel for transport and tilling the soil. They use firewood, charcoal, and manure for cooking, not natural gas. These people's livelihoods depend on what their environment provides them. This environment, in turn, is affected by way, the way we exploit our ecosystems. Many of you have seen areas, for instance, in East Africa, where the trees have been cut for fuel and agriculture. Without trees for fuel, people start using manure for their cooking fires instead of using it as fertilizer for their crops. Moreover, as food crops provide only intermediate cover, the soil reduced in organic matter and exposed to the elements degrades and erodes. Then bioenergy is no longer a renewable energy, and ecosystems can no longer provide supporting and regulating services required for sustainable livelihoods. <coughs> Another aspect of bioenergy is the emergence of biofuel. While this is only a minor part of the global energy mix, less than 0.5%, its local impact can be devastating as the crops compete over land and water with local poor farmers. Uh, speaking of impacts, energy and water, like food production, not only depend on ecosystems and the various functions and services these, these provide. The provision and use of water, energy, and food also impacts on ecosystems. And as poor people, especially in climate-sensitive areas, depend more on ecosystem services, they are also more vulnerable to the nexus. For instance, fish from the Mekong River is, is, an, is, is, important, is an important source of high-quality protein-rich nutri nutrition. Hydropower dams in the river disrupt fish migration patterns, which reduces wild fish stocks. The alternative, farming fish in cages is not accessible to everybody. As, so as, as a result, many poor people simply do not eat, eat fish or reduce eating fish. These examples 
show that interactions in water, energy, food nexus take place in a vulnerable environment, in a landscape with nature, agroecosystems, and of course, people. Placing the nexus in an ecosystem perspective is necessary to provide people with sustainable livelihood options. UNEP is keen to demonstrate links between water, energy, nexus, and ecosystem services, and advocates an ecosystem-based approach to the nexus, putting vulnerable people not at the receiving end of the impacts, but at the healthy of ecosystems. Bringing in the ecosystem dimension makes it more obvious to see the water energy and nexus in context and address related issues such as food security, land use, but also increased climate variability and climate change. But the water food uh, energy nexus depends on health ecosystems. It needs to be managed in such a way that environmental impacts are positive. Understanding the role of ecosystem services will increase sustainability for poor people in vulnerable environments. At the same time, water energy food uh, ecosystems nexus thinking helps the green economy in terms of resource efficiency as well as poor poor risk reduction strategies. Applying the ecosystem approach, the nexus requires the dialogue we have been we have here today and tomorrow. It also requires policy support, development of a, of a toolbox, and capacity building. And this and more on how UNEP plans to support the operationalization of the ecosystem approach to water, energy, and food, food in parallel. It, it will be um, presented in parallel in the parallel sessions that are going to come. Um, concerns of UNEP are essentially around the sustainability elements in the nexus, which are silent or hidden, looking at governance and models that support intersectoral collaboration for women uh, situations. This is so, as UNEP is a normative organization for those that know the job with the UN. How this thinking can influence the ongoing SDG discussions is fundamental to UNEP. Uh, UNEP is um, advocating for integrated goals um, that integrate within them not only various sectors, but also the, very strongly the sustainability dimension. These are his, uh, his, his comments. And um, um, all I can say is that he regrets very much that he's, 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 he's not here, and he said to me that um, we would like the scientific community which is here to help us to raise these two issues, um, the issue of the sustainability dimension, the nexus, and the issue of how we get the bottom core into this whole equation, and where the environment plays a role. Thank you very much. problems rather than the solutions and now uh, is the time we feel that we need a transition where we can transform knowledge to concrete actions. Our next speaker is uh, GWSP's founder member, Dr. Charles Forsmati and Charles uh, Boris Party is also spearheading uh, efforts to prepare the blueprint uh, for a reality-based uh, research agenda for the future of GWSP. Yeah, and I welcome, uh, please welcome Charles Boris Party on floor. I didn't realize I should have come up so early. Thanks for the correction.
Okay. Um, so I'm the uh, last speaker of the opening session here. Um, but um, I'd be curious then why I'm uh, producing an introduction here. So as last speaker, I'm going to introduce an idea. Um, and um, hopefully we're going to be introducing you to uh, what we will uh, think of as a new friend. And we call this friend the Sustainable Water Futures uh, Program. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to unveil <coughs> some thinking that a core team drawn from the ranks of our uh, Global Water System Project Steering Committee and our close affiliates as well as the International um, Project Office uh, here in, in Bonn, Germany. And in fact, many of you who I, I see very familiar faces uh, in the audience, many of you out there um, in the throngs of, uh, of uh, water science and water policy experts from whom we've drawn very great inspiration over the last uh, many years. And uh, I'd like to thank the uh, first set of speakers for really setting the stage for uh, this introduction that I'm going to be make, making um, uh, on behalf of, of this team. Um, as uh, Anika had mentioned, and I'm not getting a response uh, from the computer. As Anika had mentioned, this is a uh, Sorry, which button did you? Okay. Um, Nick mentioned that basically one year forward from a very important uh, conference that we had, uh, GWSP had organized uh, almost exactly one year ago uh, today. It was called Water in the Anthropocene, and it was a, uh, an opportunity for us from a global water system uh, project community to really take stock about uh, where, we, where we were 10 years ago, what we accomplished, and really laying the groundwork for where we'll be going in the future. I think uh, several of you in this room uh, actually signed the Bond Declaration on uh, Global Water Security, laying out the groundwork uh, for sustainable development of water resources globally, thinking about issues like uh, ecosystem preservation and sustainability, as uh, Thomas has just mentioned, uh, is so important, um, produce some fairly high uh, profile or becoming high profile, I should say, outputs, including a special issue of more than 20 papers in a, a current opinion in environmental sustainability, COSUS, uh, which really was a set of interesting review and opinion articles on this very subject. Uh, we're looking forward to this, uh, Springer's publication of Global Water System in the Anthropocene, uh, edited by Anik Maduri and, and, and others. And we also commissioned a very, I think, very beautiful and very interesting at the same time uh, visual summary of what we've been up to as uh, shown by this image here on the bottom right, which is an animation uh, that if you haven't seen, there's a little website there that you could uh, type into your computer and, and, and take a look at that five minute um, uh, animation and uh, infomercial as it were for, for global water system thinking akin to what we saw at the beginning of this session. Uh, do I have a pointer by any chance? Okay. Um, cranking back the hands of time about 10 years. I always like to show this when I open such uh, um, uh, strategic discussions with, with, uh, with audiences. Uh, just to point out that 10 years ago, um, to craft the central founding principle, as it were, a tenet or, or a hypothesis, which uh, we followed literally for the 10 years of Global Water System Project uh, research. Uh, it was actually hard to craft those words because we were living in somewhat of a different world uh, amongst our, our peers uh, in terms of understanding some of the full dimensions of humans and the water systems of the planet. And after many uh, editorial um, back and forths uh, to try to get this right, we came up with the following uh, very uh, carefully worded uh, statement. That humans are changing the global water system uh, in a globally significant way uh, without adequate knowledge of the system and thus its response to change. We really followed this tenet the whole time through the, through the project and I believe that it's still absolutely relevant in terms of the planning of the next phase of the global water research agenda. We put humans in some sense um, uh, as co-equals in the study of water from a biophysical standpoint, a, a 
biological and chemical standpoint. Um, and uh, we no longer could view water as a hydrologist would. I come from the hydrology world. It's no longer adequate. We really have to understand the chemistry and the biology and the um, human aspects, in some sense, a nexus question from the start. Um, I'm going to unveil for you some of the uh, stock taking that we've done, uh, uh, I'd say, over the last uh, 12 to 24 months. Uh, just to kind of lay the groundwork for the next phase of the project. So this is, uh, some sense, looking backwards, but I'm going to use it to help build a foundation to, to look forward. And I think if you look at um, the, the various uh, products that came out of that um, Water in the Anthropocene uh, uh, conference, as well as um, our own literature reviews and the, the, the um, studies that we've been doing over the many years, I think it's fair to say that we can take, as a Global Water System Project community, we can take some credit for creating a legitimacy in terms of looking at water problems from the fully global scale. Now, we're not ignoring local or regional aspects of the question. But in some sense, many of us were scared a decade ago to be talking about issues of global analysis of the system in an integrated fashion. Perhaps we as uh, biogeophysicists, and I come from that world, had a little bit of an easier task. But if we really wanted to begin linking biogeophysics and human dimensions, that was, in some sense, a decade ago, a bit of a new thing at the, at the global scale. And I show just one example. Uh, some of us from the uh, GWSP steering committee have made some contributions to the Millennium Ecosystem Center. Assessment. And one of the things that we, we did early on was to combine the geophysical view of the planet, runoff and discharge, and we combine that with the distributions of population. And in so putting these uh, two perspectives together, we can generate a map as shown there, which shows the source areas uh, in terms of provisioning uh, freshwater resources for humanity. And when you put a map like this together, you can come up with very interesting little facts that you could uh, blurt out during uh, the next cocktail party that you're at. And, and one of the interesting facets of this map that we used is you could ask the very simple question, which was never asked before. Where do most people live? And um, uh, relative to, to the water availability there. And you could divide the earth into a dry half and a wet half. And you find that 85% or so of the human population is, is, in some sense, jammed into the, the dry half of the Earth, where in the future, if you think there are water problems today, we're going to have much of the world's economic growth and, and urbanization and continued population um, density increase in this very dry half of the Earth. And uh, that was something that was unveiled, that piece of information was unveiled by a simple combination of the two perspectives, the human perspective and the biogeophysical uh, perspectives, at the global scale. In addition, and probably the bigger battle to, to have been fought over the last many years, um, and our good soldiers in this battle are two are sitting in the room here, Claudia Palmasto, my coachner, Joita Gupta, who've been really forwarding this idea of the legitimacy of looking at governance over many scales, including the global scale. And issues that come into play are those relating to uh, global trade patterns and global trade policies, and virtual water, uh, as well as uh, the impact of um, multinational corporations. What's the role of UN and the UN system and UN water, for example, um, global governance. These are very, very open questions. And in some sense, um, we're still identifying the problems of global governance at this moment, how one might uh, sail into the future with some better uh, underpinnings of the understanding of those problems in order to craft solutions. So I congratulate them for, for actually flying that particularly difficult flag. In addition, um, and I think this is one of the important elements of what we've been able to do, and I, I'm not claiming certainly full responsibility for this, but some part of it, and I know that many of uh, others of you out, out there are of similar uh, mindset, uh, but back in, uh, let's say, the turn of the century, year, year 2000, 
There was an enormous focus on water issues relating to the climate change question. But it wasn't just climate change question, as we all, I think, at this point know. But it was a bit of a battle to, to, to go into a, these dialogues where uh, you really had to try to shout above the, 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 the chaos, as it were, the other wild voices who say climate, climate, climate. Well, there are other more direct impacts that we, we really cannot forget about. And I think that um, some of the work that, certainly the work that GWSB had been engaged in, really tried to, to promote that in a very, very uh, coherent and, and very specific way. There are a couple of examples I show there. We did some early, uh, I guess, nexus uh, uh, analysis, as it were. Uh, on the left, we were uh, working with uh, Caroline Sullivan, uh, who's at the Wallingford uh, Hydrology Institute at the time. And uh, we did some water poverty, water security uh, nexus studies, as it were. We did this as a geographical study to really try to figure out what the linkages were among these, uh, of these three uh, particular entities. On the right, we extended that work uh, to a broader analysis of human water security and water security for nature, where these uh, security issues were uh, in coherence, where they were, in some sense, orthogonal. Uh, to each other, and that was featured as a uh, cover article, uh, Rivers in Crisis in Nature, back in uh, 2010. But almost all of the things we were mapping here had very little to do with climate change, and everything to do with humans on the ground today modifying their water systems. Uh, along the way, we discovered the absolute necessity for quantitative and rigorous in our thinking, and uh, we often had to assemble uh, data sets that were either produced by others in the community or we have to create de novo data sets, one of which is shown here. This is a major community-based effort that was stimulated directly by the Global Water System Project in its early years. So it emerged from our so-called fast-track activities. It was to develop uh, the Global Reservoir and Dam database that was published a couple of years back by Bernard Lerner and uh, several of us. Uh, this is the state-of-the-art data set. It remains the state-of-the-art data set on uh, the impact of impoundments on the world's river system. Well, all good things must come to an end, and we are going to be seeing a sunset too. And actually, we need to lament this. This was a planned sunset. Uh, we knew that the GWSP science agenda back in 2004 was to last a decade. Uh, we planned it out that way, and this day will soon be coming, at the end of 2014, will be the sunset. But any good sunset, and after a night of partying, results in a sunrise. And so let me talk to you a little bit about the sunrise that we are uh, anticipating. And we really welcome a dialogue with this community, and in some sense, uh, we, would, we would hope that the material that's presented over the next uh, day and a half, two days, will in fact inform uh, our uh, ability to plan out the next phase of the program. So, one of the statements I think is fair to make is that Nexus studies have all along really propelled uh, our thinking of GWSB and now uh, this new sustainable water futures um, uh, program. Uh, however, we, as Anik has pointed out, were fundamentally focused on problem identification as opposed to solutions. And now we believe is the time to begin putting the diagnostic work that we've done into a more proactive stance and to try to think about innovation and solution sets. The diagram on the right, uh, you've, I, you've actually already seen. You're going to see many of these kinds of diagrams. I'm not going to dive into any of the details here. Just simply to say you're going to be hearing about drivers of change, uh, direct and indirect, human well-being. You're going to hear about how water and energy, uh, food and perhaps land are all connected. Uh, I'll leave that to the sessions. Uh, however, I would like to say that this very conceptual model is now being uh, pushed as a, a framework for understanding the trade-offs, the many trade-offs that we heard in the prior speech, that we have to think about. And there is a strong push from the policy community on these ne nexus issues, and we ought to be, as researchers, ready to handle that particular 
challenge. It was wonderful to hear people from agencies and ministries talking about these the same demands for information. These nexus problems are fundamentally complicated affairs. They're multi, uh, multi-dimensional in terms of their uh, disciplinary perspectives. They are also multi-dimensional uh, in terms of the scale of the problems. And there are no simple solutions. Therefore, as scientists and engineers, I come from both the science and engineering background, uh, frameworks are going to be necessary for us to even have a sensible dialogue, if not actually solve these, these problems. So this is um, our initial game plan. It's a proposed game plan, and it's subject to um, input and change and editing. Uh, but this is our uh, first Sustainable Water Futures Program uh, overall framework. And in the center of that framework is this uh, red bullet here, or orange bullet, called the Water Solutions Laboratory Network. Uh, the word uh, water certainly is, is in there for us, but as well this notion of solutions through a laboratory network of partnerships is at the heart of what we're trying to do. And it's really trying to capture this notion that we must co-design solutions with partners who care. It's not uh, adequate anymore for a curiosity-based researcher like myself to go off in some odd direction and present some map or some database that I think is quite interesting to a policymaker or an environmental manager who will yawn at, at what, what we've done. We really need to be co-active, co as it were, to design the solutions. Now, that's the heart of the, the new uh, program. But it has many uh, amplifying elements, OK? And the one on the top left here is quite important. It's called synthesis research. I think it's fair to say that Global Water System Project has been engaged in synthesis research, bringing disparate pieces of information together and um, looking for synergies in otherwise separate pieces of information. I think we demonstrated in the first few slides I showed that we can do that. That's really going to be the fuel cell for this. We have to be evidence-based. We have to be reality-based. And that's the reason we have synthesis research as one of the core pillars of this effort. We are in a really interesting position, though. Because if we uh, come from a research foundation and we identify problems and are looking for solutions, we can begin to propose solutions and then put them into an assessment framework that would judge the potential benefits of these kinds of interventions and investments. Uh, but we can also take a look at what the impacts might be, positive or negative, on the Earth system and also on human well-being. And the idea would be not to benefit human well-being at the expense of the environment, as uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Steiner would, would have said, but to co-balance these. And so there's an impact assessment um, part of this. There's also uh, an implementation tracking. So we go back and forth, we design an optimal solution. <coughs> Let's say that solution is adopted. We're, again, in a very interesting and I think unique position to be able then to begin tracking this. And at the heart of this uh, initiative will be the uh, value uh, and the promotion of appropriate observational data sets and metrics and indicators to track success, or for that matter, to track failure. In addition, we want to uh, educate and train the next uh, generation of researchers and practitioners. Therefore, there's going to be a capacity development effort, very specifically built around projects. We think that it uh, becomes much more uh, sensible to focus the efforts of the next generation, the young researchers and practitioners, uh, through projects. And of course, we need outreach to raise the awareness in uh, the public sphere about uh, what we're doing here. Um, so having the framework opens up some doors uh, for us. Uh, it allows us to identify problems, co-design solutions. And we can do these at a variety of scales. I think this is what would be very interesting about moving forward of, uh, along these lines. Um, we have increasingly recognized the value of looking at global scale issues. And there are indeed many global scale water issues. There are also anticipated global scale water policies. For example, the SDGs. Uh, and I'm talking about not just 
clean drinking water, and for uh, sanitation. These are fundamentally taken as a whole, all the SDGs, are a nexus issue that we can begin to evaluate through the lens of this water futures and sustainability initiative. Okay. We could begin to analyze the impact of global trade policies. We could support UN conventions and look at how one pursuit of one conventional uh, mentality might uh, uh, collide with uh, some other, and we would be able to have a framework to at least test these ideas. Um, climate adaptation, of course, would be another uh, very important uh, component that we could, uh, and problem that we could address. We recognize that there are these strategic global questions, but there are also regionally significant strategic questions with respect to water. So for example, we could begin to analyze the impact of the ways in which uh, the human health community would battle uh, particular uh, tropical waterborne diseases. What impact might that have on a, a variety of other elements of the, uh, of the water system? Uh, optimizing irrigation, for example. Uh, if you optimize irrigation, what do you save in terms of water to do energy production, uh, to uh, dilute waste and uh, uh, produce uh, valuable clean drinking water for people? These would be the kinds of questions you could uh, answer at the regional scale. Uh, in addition, we would be able to welcome focused, uh, I would call them opportunistic, if not ad hoc problems that would come to us uh, if we are known for being fair brokers in this problem identification solution um, creation game. Uh, we should be uh, able to open our doors to NGOs and governments and the private sector perhaps to develop new technologies, and then using the framework I spoke about, evaluate those technologies that they're broadly adopted on the Earth system and human well-being. A couple of examples of what we're going to be, I think, intimately connected with. Um, one of the, the boxes that I showed in the, in the framework uh, was implementation tracking. And that's to track these interventions that one might imagine to be uh, uh, instituted for water security and human uh, well-being. Uh, the investments and the policies associated with this. Uh, we're working very actively, and Rick Wofford, who's in the room, is, is um, really is moving this forward very rapidly. Uh, we're trying to uh, co-design a program of Earth observations with the GEO, the Group on Earth Observations, it's relative to, to water-related interests. And Rick has been really the spearhead, uh, doing the spearheading of this. Um, the idea is to create integrated information packages using all the assets that we might have available to us. And he's given me this slide with this uh, constellation of these Earth system satellites, but it's not just Earth system satellites we're talking about. We're talking about survey data and census information, and we're talking about uh, on the ground kinds of data collection that might not be uh, a high technology asset circling the, uh, the Earth every 24 hours. And in so bringing these integrated packages together, you could imagine that if one would um, be supporting the World Economic Forum's uh, interest in nexus studies, you would create a, uh, some sense of customized package of information that could involve some satellite remote sensing information on the status of water and some census data on population distributions and uh, government economic statistics on the energy sector, and package those up and put them into a coherency that they might not have otherwise had. Same thing for the uh, sustainable development goals. I think there's a spectrum of water-related questions. If one were to execute each of the sustainable development goals without thinking about the next, just a, a very plain example of this from the water world is, what is the implication of trying to sewer it uh, create sewer connections to a large segment of the population that doesn't have it now, get that uh, sewage into the water, but perhaps forget to treat it or not have the resources to treat that sewage going into the rivers. Well, that, of course, has an enormous impact on biodiversity and the state of affairs with respect to the ecosystem. And not only that, it increases the cost of water treatment uh, for people downstream. So it feeds back to not only ecosystem integrity, but also human well-being. These are the kinds of questions that I think need to be on the table. We need a framework to do this, and hopefully we'll be uh, in the forefront of doing this. 
Now, one really interesting element of this uh, has to do uh, with the engagement of your partners. And uh, uh, if you look at the uh, GWSP website, if you uh, type in the word business solution and sediments, uh, you'll see a picture here of uh, Dietrich uh, Bartel, who um, is an entrepreneur who uh, looks at ways uh, to uh, uh, lessen the impact of reservoir sedimentation. It does this on individual uh, reservoir systems. And the reason that's important is you uh, lose productive capacity of the investment you've made in the reservoir. As they fill up with sediments, these are big tanks of water, and when upstream sediments come in, because it's a slow-moving tank of water, uh, the sediments are dropped out, and they fill the reservoir. And you lose the productive capacity for irrigation or for hydro potential. And he's looked at this on an individual basis. And they began to survey some of the outputs from the Global Water System Project. And one of the things that we've been engaged in is trying to articulate the global dimension of the sediment retention question. It has enormous implications on downstream ecosystems. It has enormous implications on people who live in deltas of the world, where the deltas no longer are being nourished by the sediment that used to flow from upstream. There's coastal erosion of problems, etc. He um, came to us, he said, let's partner with us. So I view him as a, uh, in a sense, a, a worked example, this new client base for the uh, Sustainable Water Futures uh, Program. And uh, we would welcome these kinds of um, initiatives. So welcome to all, and thanks to all uh, of the institutions and sponsors of this effort. Uh, made this possible. Uh, in particular, this would not have happened without the inputs of the IPO. And so thanks to all the people that stood there. And uh, thank you. Additional information is, as always, at the World Water System uh, Project uh, website. Thank you. So we, we cannot uh, have more questions. Maybe one or two questions we can, you know, we can get. Yes. Um, can I ask speakers uh, to go there? Yeah. yeah. So we can face the audience and face the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can provide.
the, the situation of uh, the mode of negative coordination is more comfortable because you don't engage in, uh, in controversies with your colleagues on why a different way of delineating responsibilities uh, is necessary. So uh, the difficulty is to, to show that um, joint up action means that you coordinate efforts, you do not question the, the expertise and the own logic of each sector, but you um, mobilize the, the positive contributions, the benefit of joint action. But this way of thinking is very unusual in our political systems. Our political systems are defined by, um, by turf battles. So um, that's why I said that it's probably a situation of um, political, um, it, it, you have to look for windows of opportunity where either um, uh, uh, where, like, like what, what actually Charles was saying for the type of knowledge which can be mobilized by integrated research projects and, uh, like, like this one where you, um, or like the yeah, IPCC at certain times also did, and where you need to then bring the attention to, to political leaders, um, to, to courageous people ready to break through the frontiers, to uh, take an initiative. But this is um, uh, why I, I also suggest that it's probably very important for us to better understand where um, the declarations of willingness to engage in, in joint up action where they meet their limits. To so have a better understanding of that too. Yes, <coughs> my name is Stefan Lundbrock, uh, UNESCO IG, and I'm looking very brief. I, I have a question for Professor um, uh, Bersmonti. Uh, Charlie, very interesting presentation. I, I was particularly inspired by, by this idea of that new sustainable water future program that you set up. And you also said, well, oh, with the team, I'm currently writing the, the, the science plan, or if I understood that correctly. But I was just wondering, looking at these challenges that you have, would it, would it be not wise already from the beginning to involve all the other stakeholders as well in the design of that, of that science plan, or having representatives from, from governments or, or public sector, but also private sectors, people from SMEs, you showed one entrepreneur, and I hope he's heavily involved in the design of it but also maybe multinationals, NGOs, uh, uh, all, all other representatives, also civil society, to, to co-design that program for the coming 10 years to make it more uh, demand-driven and also effective later. Uh, I, I think that's the whole idea. And what we're trying to do right now is to try to lay out uh, a sketch of what we think would be a framework for that very discussion. And, and I would actually point to the folks in the audience here. I, I think uh, you're 100% welcome, if not uh, encouraged, <coughs> And perhaps we'll, some of you will be forced, uh, uh, in, in a good-natured good way, uh, to, um, to to give us your insights and, and help to co-design this from the start. And I, I see this event as, in a sense, uh, kicking that, that process off. That's simple. Yes. Yeah. Hank Fain, uh, Water Innovation Center, International Institute for Sustainable Development in Canada. I, I'm going to uh, attempt to uh, well, pose a question. Uh, with respect to that uh, cohort of policy entrepreneurs that are willing to engage in that positive coordination space, I suspect that that's possible when they're coordinating with business entrepreneurs. And I was heartened to see that diagram from the World Economic Forum in Dr. Boris Barney's presentation because it's worth reminding all of us that when the World Economic Forum put this nexus issue into the mainstream, their point was that this, this cluster of correlated risk is actually a cluster of correlated opportunity if you can see it correctly. If you can, if you can sort of back away from the prob problem far enough to see it differently and see how creative solutions can create synergies amongst water, energy, and food security. So the, that cohort of entrepreneurs will be policy and business entrepreneurs, and they will um, create the enthusiasm amongst the more recalcitrant policymakers, I would think. Just a comment. He's a comment.
Einfluss von uns hat. Ich würde gerne like to comment. I think we learned nothing in the water community. Our acceptance outside the water community was always difficult because we always focused on water. It was uh, with uh, IWIM, it was with the Global Water Systems Project, and it will continue with the Water Future Project. The lack we have is that we have no acceptance in other sectors for what we are doing. Water should be the driving force. This is the thinking behind. And uh, I think this is not the way where we get acceptance outside. Uh, if I, might, I, I would take that as a comment and declare the uh, coffee break to begin. 